uh, Saigon fell. That was the end of the war for the South Vietnamese and North Vietnam, as they had always sought to do, had unified the country by force under their communist domination. So let me go back and say a little bit about uh, how those various periods uh, uh, went in terms of how they were conducted, and they were quite different. In the earlier period, when General Westmoreland took command and we began to deploy the large number of forces that I've described, his approach to the war uh, it was to conduct what he called a war of attrition and to conduct operations in pursuit of that, uh, of, of that strategy uh, that were characterized primarily as search and destroy operations. And what this meant was the measure of merit in this period of the war was body count because the objective of a war of attrition was to kill as many of the enemy as possible. And the theory was that if you killed enough of the enemy, they would lose heart, cease their aggression against South Vietnam, and therefore our objectives would be accomplished. And our objective was very simply, always from the start to the end, was to enable South Vietnam to, main, to sustain and maintain itself as an independent, non-communist government, free of domination from the North. During the period of this war of attrition, as I mentioned, the buildup continued, and the, the use of these forces, larger and larger American forces, was primarily to conduct large-scale, multi-battalion, sometimes even multi-division operations, primarily in the heavily jungled areas adjacent to South Vietnam's extended western border with Laos and Cambodia. And one of the major problems of this period was finding a, a, an elusive enemy because we had said, politically, we had put the constraint on ourselves that we would not cross those western borders. So if the enemy decided or desired to disengage, they had a relatively simple mechanism for doing that, which was simply to move to the west to cross the borders, and they were then off limits or out of reach of our forces and those of the South Vietnamese. During this same period, the South Vietnamese forces were relegated to somewhat of a secondary mission in support of what was called pacification, and I'm sorry to say they were also uh, given uh, rather inferior weapons, uh, largely cast off World War II American weapons. Now, don't you World War II veterans get, get a, a huffy here now. Uh, those were great weapons in World War II, uh, but they were not the best weapons in the world by the time uh, uh, we're talking about here now. And furthermore, if any of you have ever lugged a BAR, for example, and you look at the average uh, Vietnamese, uh, a person of rather slight stature, and think of them trying to lug a BAR through the jungle, that's not the easiest task in the world. Meanwhile, American forces were getting the best first-line weaponry to include the M16 rifle. And, uh, and by the way, so were the enemy forces, which in 1965 began to be armed with the best of current uh, CHICOM and Soviet bloc weaponry to include the famous AK-47. Unfortunately, it was not until about three years later that the South Vietnamese began to get comparable weaponry. So if you hear people criticize the South Vietnamese forces in these earlier years, I think it's only fair to bear in mind they had inferior weaponry not only inferior to what the American forces had, but inferior to what the enemy forces had. And by the way, Americans were also hogging most of uh, what we might call combat wherewithal. I'm talking about close air support. I'm talking about B-52 bomber raids. I'm talking about uh, uh, in, intra-theater troop lift. I'm talking about helicopter gunship support. All things which are, are combat multipliers and, and which the American forces had in abundance, the South Vietnamese very little. How did this work out during this period? I will have to say that it, it, the uh, approach of General Westmoreland was uh, in highly successful in its own terms, which means that large casualties were inflicted on the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, a horrifying number of casualties, really, but the, the intended and desired and anticipated outcome did not result. They did not give up uh, uh, their aggression against the South. They simply kept sending more and more forces south, and of course many of them were slaughtered too, but yet more came to take their place. 
so, so the, uh, uh, the hoped for outcome was not achieved during this period. Meanwhile, it's only fair to say that two other important missions uh, did not get the attention that the conduct of the ground war was getting. Uh, to wit, the South Vietnamese were uh, uh, not trained, counseled, uh, uh, advised, and improved as, as they might have been, both because they were on this secondary mission and because, as I've described, they did not get the, uh, uh, the first-line weaponry that other forces were getting. And another extremely important mission, which was uh, a conduct of the pacification program in the villages and hamlets of South Vietnam also was neglected. And the importance of that was that the communists had in place and had had in place for a long time in these villages and hamlets a covert infrastructure that was through terrorism and coercion uh, keeping the South Vietnamese people, the populace in the rural parts of Vietnam, under their domination. And until you came in and dealt with that, rooted out this infrastructure and neutralized it, the, the, the people uh, could not and were not free, no matter what happened out in the deep jungle. So that was a, that was a, a major problem. The Tet Offensive of 1968, uh, which took place uh, beginning in the end of, end of January and continued on through most of February, uh, was a, a, uh, a huge event, a watershed event, I think it's fair to say, in the history of the war. In part because during the months be preceding that, Lyndon Johnson and, and General Westmoreland and, uh, and uh, Secretary Rusk and others had been saying that the war was proceeding extremely well. And then people saw across America, saw on their television screens, this offensive in which all of a sudden in most of the major cities and towns of Vietnam, here came uh, enemy uprisings that were totally unanticipated, at least by the people at home. And there's an argument about whether they were anticipated uh, uh, by the forces in the field. And, uh, and, and cataclysmic and dramatic events followed from that, including Lyndon Johnson's uh, uh, famous uh, statement that he would not run for re-election and his decision to uh, begin a partial bombing halt of North Vietnam. Soon after that, and I'm going to gallop along here in the, in the interest of time, the command changed in Vietnam. General Creighton Abrams replaced General William C. Westmoreland Interestingly enough, they were, world, they were 1936 classmates at the United States Military Academy. Uh, Westmoreland, an artilleryman, Abrams, a, a tanker, and a horse cavalryman before that, who had been a, a great hero in World War II when he commanded a tank battalion that had, had broken through the German encirclement to relieve the 101st Airborne Division uh, when they were encircled at Bastogne. And, and many other dramatic things. Abrams uh, had a different view of the nature of the war, and, and that view led him to prosecute it in a different way. He uh, saw the war as one war, as he described it, along with his uh, two excellent colleagues, Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker and William Colby, who had uh, come out from the Central Intelligence Agency to, uh, to be in charge of support for the pacification program. They all described it as one war, and one war meant continuation, yes, of the, of the military fighting, as had been the case in the earlier period, but much revised, and I'll tell you why, continuation of that, but in equal measure, emphasis on pacification and getting out that infrastructure, which I described, and on upgrading the South Vietnamese armed forces, so they became more and more capable of undertaking the major responsibility for defense of their country. Uh, these things were enhanced by now finally uh, giving the South Vietnamese first line equipment, giving them a better training, uh, and especially incorporating into the armed forces and giving uh, emphasis to territorial forces. Territorial forces were what were called regional forces and popular forces, and they uh, remained at the province and district level, uh, and that meant that they were basically defending their homeland and their family.